Okay. So welcome back uh, on this webinar series. And it is our great pleasure today to welcome uh, Professor Richard Porter from the University of Bristol. And uh, Richard is going to talk on manipulating water waves with bathymetric plate arrays. And this is a joint work with Christos Marangos and Simin Zeng. Professor Porter. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so Christos uh, was my PhD student. He's just finished, and Simming is at Plymouth University and has uh, been a close collaborator on um, at least some of what I'm going to say today, but in general on plate arrays in water waves. Um, so, as I explained in the build up to this, um, I'm going to try and uh, explain how there are connections between. Uh, the water wave setting and um, the acoustics and the electromagnetic setting that perhaps people are more familiar with and try and show where there are differences as well. So there are some differences. Um, and so that will be a key element of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, most of the applications that I'm going to talk about are going to be firmly in the water wave setting. So they'll relate specifically uh, to the fact that I've got a fluid over um, bathymetry over a, a fluid bed. Um, there will be some instances where the problems that I'm going to talk about are out and out, have out and out an analogies with acoustics and electromagnetics. Uh, so this is a brief, brief outline of what I'm going to talk about. It's actually not very accurate because it sort of meanders through more than four different subjects. And towards the end, I sort of start to skip over the mathematical details and show you a few more of the types of examples that you can generate, um, the types of results that you can generate using these bathymetric plate array type of metamaterials. Okay, so um, this is what we're faced with. So these are the equations of water waves. So I've just, I've just thrown everything onto the page here. Um, I think, I can't remember, it might have been Richard Feynman, but somebody once famously said, maybe one of you will be able to tell me that if you want to teach an undergraduate about waves, the worst thing that you could possibly show them is water waves. Um, so this is sort of against what you might imagine because water waves are very tangible. You can see them, right? So you can actually observe them very easily in contrast to EM waves and acoustic waves or even uh, seismic waves, elastic waves. Um, and the complication really is sort of like encap encapsulated in this slide here, right? Because these are very, complicated equations. We have uh, uh, the conservation of mass equation, so that's a scalar equation. U is my velocity field. And then we have momentum equation. This is a vector equation. So in total, you've got four equations here for four unknowns, the three components of the velocity field and the pressure field. And one of the things I think that makes uh, water waves much more difficult to consider than acoustic, uh, elastic, or electromagnetic waves is this term here. The fact that you've got at gravity and it acts along one particular direction. So your driving force um, points in a single direction, okay? So you, in some sense, there is a lack of symmetry in the equations, okay? So you have a special direction, in other words, and that special direction is the depth. And of course, waves, water waves, are actually not body waves. They don't exist in the body of the fluid, but they're surface waves. So they're rather more like Rayleigh waves in elasticity, for example. Now, these are complicated, not just because of the number of variables, but the fact that they're coupled and because of this nonlinear term here. OK, so this is a nonlinear term which complicates things. I have Dirichlet, sorry, Neumann boundary conditions, so no flow conditions on Sorry, I said Neumann there. I'm getting ahead of myself. I have no flow conditions on solid fixed boundaries. And actually, the real complication in this problem comes from the free surface. Um, so I have a free moving boundary problem here. Uh, that is to say that one of the unknowns of the problem is one of the surfaces of the problem. So I have to impose these conditions on something which is actually part of the solution. So this is a free boundary pro problem. And of course, in some sense, all of these complications are anticipated because if you go and observe water waves in a natural setting, say set, sit on a beach or a harbour wall and observe what water waves do, of course, they're very, very complicated things. And that complication must be contained within these equations. 
So as I suggested, these are really complicated things to think about. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm not the first person to have done this. Of course, people immediately try and simplify things. And you can do these in different orders, um, but this is sort of like essentially the, the, the most straightforward way of thinking about it, which is first of all, to try and linearize those nonlinear equations and try and get rid of the complication of the fact that you've got this free moving boundary condition on uh, an unknown surface. And so uh, you linearize by assuming small amplitudes. Okay, so small amplitudes mean small with respect to the depth and actually small with respect to the wavelength. This immediately gets rid of the nonlinear term and it helps you with the boundary conditions. Okay, and then in order to try and transport you into the world of acoustics and uh, electromagnetics, um, two dimensional acoustics, two dimensional TETM electromagnetics or anti plane shear and elasticity, I'm going to say that there are two things that you can do at this point. One is to make an additional assumption on your fluid flow that you have no vorticity in the flow. That means to say that it's irritational. And that allows me to represent the fluid velocity in terms of a velocity potential. Or, so I've got two cases here. One is to exploit some length scale contrast in the problem and assume that I either have long waves or shallow water. There's a contrast between uh, the wavelength and the depth of the water. And in this second uh, assumption, this allows me to essentially say that the fluid flow, the fluid velocity is independent of the depth. Okay, that is to say that it just moves in, in the horizontal plane with no dominant flow in the vertical direction, and there is no dependence upon the depth. So this is what I call shallow water theory, and this is potential theory. So let's see how these things play out when I uh, put these assumptions into the previous slide. I'm going to have two cases. This is my first case. This is my potential theory, where I assume that I've got no vorticity, so no turbulence in the flow. Uh, then my equation is reduced to uh, Laplace's equation in the fluid. So that's a three-dimensional Laplace's equation. Uh, Neumann boundary conditions on the potential on the fixed boundaries. And then uh, the, the surface of the flow, which contains the driving force, which is gravity, looks like this. So this is the time dependent model. It's a linearized boundary condition which combines the kinematic and dynamic aspects of the boundary condition. Okay, and this is now posed because of linearization. It's posed upon the mean uh, surface on z equals zero. Now the surface, the free surface elevation itself is just an auxiliary variable. I can find that after the fact, after the matter, I can go back and retrieve this. It's not now coupled to my problem. I can now solve the problem fully in, in terms of my velocity potential. Okay, so uh, I mean, this is just textbook stuff. This is the type of stuff that you would teach an undergraduate student um, about linear water waves. Now to make the connection with, so this is full 3D and depth dependence. Um, it's now linear and there are two things that you can do. Immediately you can move this into the frequency domain. That is to assume that the motion has a single frequency omega. And the second thing is to um, say that if I have a uniform dependence in the depth, that is to say, uh, whatever scattering features I have in my fluid, provided that they uniform, extend uniformly through the depth to a constant flat bed, I can remove the depth dependence. Okay, so it's like separation of variables. I can separate out the depth, de oops, the depth dependence ah, via this um, uh, Koch term here. And this leaves me with a two dimensional uh, velocity potential. It's now complex. Okay, in the two dimensional plane, which is just the cross section now through the surface, which includes these obstacles that extend up through the depth. And that just satisfies the two dimensional wave equation. Okay, so now you're back on familiar, familiar ground. If you're working in 2D acoustics or TE or TM polarized EM um, wave motion. And then on the on the scattering bodies, you have this Neumann boundary condition. Um, I guess one of the sort of auxiliary differences between this and other wave theories is that uh, these are dispersive waves. So there's a dispersion relation here, which relates the um, frequency to the wave number. 
okay but that's just incidental the, the, the key point here is that we've reduced our water wave equation under all of these assumptions and under the assumption that we have uniformity in the depth to a two-dimensional wave equation so that's case one case two is this shallow water theory and this is often something that people use when they're trying to make an, a connection between water waves and uh, EM or acoustics. Okay, so that, just to remind you, this is when we restrict ourselves to long wavelength and shallow water. Okay, so there's a contrast in length scales, and this allows me to go back to my original, um, my original govern governing equations, put in the ansatz about the independence with Z in the fluid motion, this tells me that when I integrate the pressure, the pressure is hydrostatic. It's just driven by the weight of the water above um, um, the mean surface. Okay, so this relative difference here between the surface and the depth. So the pressure is hydrostatic. Um, if I introduce the depth average flux, this turns out to be a good thing to think about. So that's the velocity times the depth gives me the flux average through the depth. Uh, what turns out is that this is the mass equation integrated up, and this eats up the boundary conditions on the bottom and on the surface. Okay, so it uses up those boundary conditions through this depth averaging. And this is my momentum equation. This is mass, momentum. I've used up all of the equations, including the boundary conditions. I eliminate between these two. And I end up with this equation here, which is a dynamic equation in the time domain for the evolution of the surface of the fluid. Now, the advantage with this particular description that you didn't see before. So this, again, is a two dimensional wave equation. OK, this is the two dimensional, uh, the two dimensional gradient and divergence that I've got here is that under this framework, I'm allowed for the fluid to be able to very, oh God, sorry, very slowly uh, with respect to the spatial coordinates. So in the previous example, I needed a flat, flat bed. In this particular example, I'm allowed for the bed to be slowly varying. Okay, and that's just a description of the slow variation. Um, again, of course, this is a linear, um, equations so I can take out a, a, um, a time a specific uh, variation with an angular frequency omega and this would what be what my two-dimensional wave equation would look like and on any solid vertical objects I would have a Neumann boundary condition as well okay so I've got two examples where I take the complicated linear I take the complicated equations of water waves and I can reduce them to slightly different versions of a two-dimensional wave equation. Okay, so that's essentially the connection that you can make between the two, bearing in mind that really the full description of the fluid is one in which you've got full depth dependence. Okay, so, um, so here I am, I say the two-dimensional equations for either the potential flow case, phi, where you've got uniformity in the depth, or for eta, where we, we allow the depth to vary, are often used to translate metamaterial techniques and results into a water wave setting. So these are things like cloaking, um, perfect lensing, negative refraction, and all of these exotic things that you see associated with EM and acoustics. You can sort of map them straight onto a water wave setting by using one of these two descriptions that I've just described. It's not always the case that you have to do this. And when I started looking at these types of things um, nearly, yeah, probably about 10 years ago, I was interested in uh, cloaking. I was interested in, in cloaking a vertical cylinder through extending through the depth using variable bathymetry. So that's using the shape of the bed of the fluid to somehow redirect the water waves around a circular cylinder. I mean, I looked at many different techniques specific to water waves in which this might work without looking at things like uh, the usual transformation media techniques, although I included those kind of things in what I was looking at. But we ended up, me and a, um, a collaborator, Nick Newman from MIT, ended up looking at uh, using variable bathymetry in a full 3D setting, okay, with full depth dependence. 
So that's not the two things that I've just talked about where I've reduced it to a 2D wave equation, but actually including the full depth dependence. And these are just some of the examples that we came up with. These are brute force calculations where we expanded the bed um, geometry in some basis of functions and did some optimization to try and reduce the total scattered, scattered field. So this isn't doing anything particularly clever. This was just doing some kind of brute force optimization to try and cloak the cylinder and produce zero diffracted waves from the cylinder. But it worked and it got me very interested in this whole subject. OK, so you can do 3D, essentially. That is a thing that you might want to do, but it becomes very, very hard. And this all had to be done. This stuff that you see, these pictures that you see generated here had to be done essentially using sort of complicated uh, boundary element CFD type methods. OK, so going back to um, before I get to plate arrays, which is where I've been working on most recently, let me just sort of tell you a little, little bit more about the story and tell me where you, tell you where you can take these kind of things. So remember, there are these two different descriptions that I've got, the shallow water theory description, which reduces you to 2D, and this potential flow where you've got uniformity through the depth, which reduces you to 2D as well. OK, so Sebastian will be familiar with this particular picture or this particular piece of work that I'm going to talk about now because he was involved in it, I believe, anyway. And, and this would have um, been work that took place in Liverpool, I guess, with Mov Chan and uh, Farhat and Sebastian. And they looked at uh, manipulating water waves by using uh, narrow uh, arrays of sub-wavelength vertical posts extending through the fluid. OK, so again, these posts extended fully through the fluid. So I can use this potential flow description. I can go to a two-dimensional uh, wave equation of this type here okay and then you can exploit within this ring of um, sub wavelength array of posts you can use the fact that there is a contrast in in length scales between the wavelength and the microstructure to apply homogenization techniques okay so you can take the region in here OK, and argue through homogenization that the effective field in that region looks something like this, where you've introduced uh, a tensor between the divergence and the gradient. So this is for those people that do this stuff all the time. This is all just very, very classical homogenization. OK, and what you end up doing is in order to find the elements of this uh, tensor, you end up having to solve on a, a on a cell problem in the micro scale coordinates. This is what one of those cells might have looked like. I've just nabbed these pictures from that 2008 paper. If you have symmetry like you have in this particular problem, although this is an R theta coordinates, but there is symmetry in the R and theta directions then these two off diagonal terms disappear. And then you can compute these diagonal terms, which give you sort of an, 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 an isotropy if you have something which is um, extended further in one direction than in another direction. So you can make these two terms different from one another. And to calculate those two terms, you can just solve a cell problem in which you just have a, a potential solving a Laplace's equation with some forcing on the walls. OK, so just basically there is an ingredient as a way of working out what those constituents that, that those tensors should be. Um, and you can compute them, at least in principle, using some packages or semi-analytically, semi semi if that's what you want to do. I guess trying to pr produce experimental results for this particular problem were very, very difficult. And um, maybe I've hinted a couple of reasons as to why that should be. So in this particular problem, because of the length scales that you see here, okay, this is a very, very small length scales, and you start interfering with the way in which uh, water waves work with small obstacles. In particular, you start having to worry about viscous effects, contact line dynamics, vortex shedding at the sharp corners of each of these microstructures, amongst a whole host of other things that might be introduced, including nonlinearities. OK, and that's essentially, although what, this is going back to my original point, although water waves are easy to look at, actually, they've, they come with all of these extra features, which are very, very difficult to deal with experimentally. I, I know that Vincent Pagnier is on listening to this talk, so he knows about this stuff because that's something that he's been doing for a long time. 
Um, in terms of cloaking, I should also mention that you need to do two things with cloaking. You need to be able to switch on anisotropy, so you need to be able to have spatial control and anisotropy of this particular term here, but you also need spatial control of this term here. Um, in this particular paper, they didn't mention that, but um, one could actually change, there's a dimension in this problem that you could actually alter in order to have spatial control of that, and that would be the depth. So it's kind of a hybrid between the two different things that I've just talked about. One way you've got things extending through the depth and the other one where you've got slow variation in the depth. And there is actually, you can do a bit of both if you want to. And I haven't presented exactly how, but you can do a bit of both. And if you did a bit of both, then you could also have spatial control of the second parameter as well. Right, so I want to talk about plate arrays, uh, which so essentially what I've just shown you is what happens when you homogenize the bulk. Okay, By extending posts through the fluid, you've essentially done something to the bulk of the fluid. You've changed the properties of the flow. Um, another thing you can do is change the boundary conditions in order to be able to manipulate water waves. And essentially this is it, although it's a bit really, again, a bit of both. Now I'm going to try and manipulate the bed or change the geometry of the bed in order to have some influence on the way in which waterways propagate. So this is my cartoon of what I'm going to think about here. So these are like toast racks, like sticking up from, so these are like slices, protrusions sticking up from the bed of a material. Okay, and so you have narrow channels in between these protrusions. The protrusions or these barriers or plates are aligned with the y-axis. That's just without loss of generality. I mean, you can set these things up in different coordinate systems if you absolutely must. But let's just think about it in terms of Cartesians and give this structure an orientation so that this is in the y direction. And then if I take a cross section in the x direction, you'll see that this is made up of abrupt changes like steps from a lower level h plus to an upper level h minus. Okay, and I want to look at this in a shallow water setting. I should say that, I mean, I've done some recent work on this, but work has uh, been ongoing with lots of people working in France, uh, Agnès Morel, Vincent Pagnier, Philippe Pessijon, um, and uh, JJ Marigo, and um, other people as well that I've forgotten to mention. So this is a, a, a bathymetric metamaterial that has been looked at since about 2013. Okay, and um, always in the shallow water regime, and that's where we're working as well. So we're assuming that the wavelengths are much larger than the depth. But in addition, and this is what's novel about the stuff that I think I brought to this with my PhD student Christos, is that you, we've also got another small parameter in the problem, which is that the gaps between these plates is also narrow. And I mean narrow with respect to the distance between the top and the bottom of these plates. OK, and the thickness of the plates is determined by this parameter theta, which enters in everywhere. But really, I'm going to actually only think of this theta as being very, very small. And so these, these thick pieces of barriers, I'm really thinking about them being actually very, very thin. So rather more like thin plates rather, rather than thick pieces of toast, for want of a better word. I'm, stuck with toast racks for some, for some reason. OK, so um, you can follow, formally, homogenize this using a shallow water derivation. You've got small parameters here. So there's one small parameter associated with this. There's another small parameter associated with this contrast here. And you can do this formally um, through the water wave equations coupled to homogenization. And there's a formal process by which this happens. But there's a much easier way, sort of physical way of thinking about this, which gives you access to the same results. So I can immediately say, for example, that the pressure will still be hydrostatic. I mean, if you don't believe me, that's fine. But this seems fairly obvious to me that the pressure doesn't feel these structures in the depth. It just, the hydrostatic pressure just exists through the depth in exactly the same way, irrespective of the structure. I can define also a depth average flux, and this is where really the guts of the new equation comes in. If you think about this, flux is the amount of fluid. So the flux has got two components here. This is a vector, 
the flux in the x direction is the rate of transport of fluid across the top of this structure okay and that's just the local depth to h minus times the flow velocity scalar u in the y direction you can see that you have a different flux so the fluid can flow in a different way a different volume per unit time can flow in this direction because I can get the total amount of H minus going through plus stuff going through the gaps as well. Okay, so I can get H minus plus all the stuff going through the gaps. This is just the area contained in one of these rectangles in between the gaps. Okay, so this is the depth average flux. Okay, and then when I depth integrate my mass equation and I depth integrate my momentum equation, I can do essentially the same thing and I turn, it turns out that I get essentially the same equations as before, apart from the fact that this was a scalar before, and this now becomes this um, diagonal tensor term. Okay, and that's because when I depth integrate again, I'm picking up the area associated with the momentum traveling in the uh, x and the y direction separately. So this was always a scalar equation, so I always get the same thing here. And when I combine these two, you can see that I get this effective medium equation. So this is now the depth integrated shallow water equations, which incorporates explicitly this bathymetric plate array. So whereby before with a conventional bed, I just had the scalar h of x, y. I now have a tensor, which tells me that uh, waves travel uh, with different phase speeds in different directions. OK, and I have this specification of what those can be. So I can control them independently by controlling H plus and H minus the height or the depth of uh, these two different levels. OK, so H bar here is now just rather than carrying around all of this stuff, I've just called it H bar. As I said, there has been work done on this before. And so it was kind of interesting to look at how this kind of compared with what other people had done. Um, so this is a diagram taken from a paper of Agnes Morel and others in, I can't remember who all of the authors were in 2017. And they did, again, in they looked at shallow water approximation, but they didn't make uh, the narrow spacing approximation on top that we've made here. Um, so that when they homogenized, they had to solve one of these cell problems that I talked about before. So they, had, they, they needed to solve a potential flow problem in a single cell. OK, so it was kind of, I mean, it's not difficult, but it was semi-explicit rather than the explicit prescription for those two diagonal elements of the tension that I had before. Uh, and these are the types of uh, geometries that they were looking at. So this is the kind of thing that we are working on. So these are these narrow gaps between the barriers. This is something that we can't do. These are wide gaps between the barriers. And our results fall upon. So this green line is universal. This green line is the upper left. Um, I'm pointing in this direction. The way you look at it, I should be pointing in this direction, perhaps. But the upper, upper left element of the tensor, that's always the same for all of the models that have been used. There's been three separate models, right? The first model gave this dotted line prediction. So that was based upon using shallow water, but using it as a standard layered homogenization. That doesn't work because of these abrupt changes in depth, and that's not commensurate with using shallow water theory. So this is a this is a really foul approximation that was first used. These are the improved approximations in this paper here using this semi-explicit scheme. And then our approximation is actually just the this axis here, it just runs along 0.4, okay, which just says that it's a constant. Oh, I got it, I got it the wrong way around. This green line here is the bottom right of the, that's the one with the theta in, okay, that's the diagonal line with theta. This is the top left, this is just h minus, that's just a constant. So you can see that we get agreement, basically. Right, so um, let's try and do a, a calculation and show you some examples of um, how you can use this bathymetric plate array to produce some um, nice type of uh, wave dynamics. And this is the simplest thing that you can think about doing, which is um, you imagine that there's an interface along um, x equals zero between a semi-infinite domain to the 
left in x is less than zero and the domain in x is greater than zero. To the left, I just have constant depth fluid. Okay, so I just have um, a uniform medium, if this was an, an acoustic case, for example. Okay, so my wave equation here um, is just the standard wave equation, okay, because I'm just going over a standard bed, and the bed is a fixed constant depth, the uniform depth h naught. Okay, so I've just got the standard uh, wave equation here, and I'm sending in a plane wave from the left, okay, and it's an oblique plane wave, okay, so I've got an obliqueness um, theta naught, that's the angle with respect to the positive x axis. And it gets reflected back with a reflection coefficient r. Okay, so this is, you know, that's that's the solution in x is less than zero. Okay, so there's lots of symbols here. I don't really want you to focus on the symbols so much, just on the problem that I'm trying to solve and what I'm trying to tell you about the problem. Okay, to the right of x equals zero, I've got this bathymetric plate array, which has been described in this diagram here. So I've got my h minus and I've got my h plus, and these are going to be constants because I want a, an easy problem to solve. So these are our constants. h plus can be greater than h naught. Um, so I can have these extending to any of any particular depth. I can have them both greater than h naught, both less than h naught if I want. But here I've got one less than h naught and one greater than h naught. And I'm going to swing everything round through delta. An angle delta. So I'm also going to allow myself to reorientate these, this plate array. Okay, and so my governing equation now is more complicated than the scalar case here. I've got this tensor in here, and this tensor has had to be subject to rotation. Okay, so the divergence and the gradients have been rotated. So I've got these rotation matrices in here, and my h delta isn't just simply this diagonal term here, but it's pre and post multiplied by these rotation matrices. So it's a little bit more complicated as well, okay. But we'll suffer that little bit of extra complication because it gives you a, a much more, a much richer tapestry of results. Okay, so here's something that sort of makes your your eyes want to bleed a little bit. But bear with me, okay. This is what the solution now looks like. I can now just solve this wave equation, okay, to the right. It's straightforward. Separation of variables. I have to impose the same variation in the y direction. This is just like uh, um, Snell's law, when you derive Snell's law, I've got to have the same uh, variation in the y direction. Okay, and that tells me what the variation in the x direction must be. So the x direction looks like this, alpha one plus. There are two modes, one typically you think of as traveling to the right, and there's another wave, wave that can come from, so one's left to right and one's right to left. And these are signified by this plus minus. And it, you can see that I'm just solving a quadratic equation to get this result here. And there's some interesting things that happen here, because when you look at this quadratic equation, you say, well, hang on a minute. Um, do these alpha ones, does alpha one plus have to be positive and alpha one minus have to be negative? And you look at it and say, well, no, it doesn't. They can actually both be negative. And what this means is that this gives me the possibility of a phase velocity, even though energy is going, to, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, even though energy will be propagating away from x equals zero to the right, okay, I'm going to have a phase velocity which is pointing in the other direction, okay, because I have this possibility. Only for some parameters, okay, and there's lots of parameters embedded in this equation, but just superficially from this quadratic equation, that can happen. Of course, I can also get, you look at this, and you, you know with solutions of quadratic equations, you don't have to just get real solutions, you can get complex conjugate solutions. And that will correspond to total internal reflection, okay, which is a well known phenomenon where you go from a one medium into another medium with a whatever the, the wave speed is such that the waves can't propagate in and oblique waves get totally reflected. So there is that possibility encapsulated in here as well. Okay, so that's my general solution. Of course, I have to match, and I match pressures and fluxes in the appropriate way at the interface x equals zero, and I get these explicit expressions for r and t. Okay, and here's q. I've just done the maths. Okay, there's just symbols everywhere, but it's everything's explicit. 
Um, so now I'm going to get on to the angles. So this is trying to tell you now that um, you can get all kinds of refractive effects. Okay, so the first thing to say is that the phase velocity direction I can work out, and I've just told you what that should be. I just have to work out the wave number in the y direction, the wave number in the x direction, okay, and it's just the angle of that vector which gives me the phase velocity. So that's the direction in which I see the, the surface waves traveling. But I can also think about where the energy is directed, so that's the group velocity, and that direction is given by what I call theta 1. This is what the group velocity looks like. It's just the omega by d and then the two components of the wave vector. And of course, I say of course, this just turns out to be proportional to the direction in which the fluid is traveling, so the flux or the velocity vector. Okay, so if you look at these diagrams down below here, um, I'm going to do some experiments of, um, so that I'm going to have uh, the bathymetric plate array at minus 45 degrees, I'm going to send in a wave of theta, and I'm going to measure the energy flow theta 1. What you'll see from this, so this is the exact setup, but I don't tell you about the heights of the plate arrays here. What you can see from this is if theta naught is pointing this way, and these plate arrays are protruding above the bed, then I'll get zero reflection, or theta 1 will be exactly the same as theta naught for minus 45. So here's minus 45. So no matter whatever the height of the barriers is, okay, I get I get waves traveling through uninterrupted. This is the effect of making the barriers come higher and higher from a flatbed up towards the surface. Okay, and eventually what happens here is that for all angles, theta naught of incidence, the energy flow is in the direction 40, uh, 40, minus 45 degrees. So all the flow has to go between the plates. So that's what you think that should happen, right? As the plates fill the space, the flow can only go along the plates. Uh, in contrast, this is for what I call a sunken bed. So now the level, so it's like I've dug a pit and the plate arrays are all embedded in this pit. Now you think about a wave coming in this direction, it just runs like a bike would run over the top of a cattle grid. It feels this completely uninterrupted. And so when theta naught is 45 degrees, theta one will always be 45 degrees, no matter how deep the cattle grid is. So all of the points go through here. But again, as I make it more and more sunken, I get closer and closer to this minus 45 degrees. Okay, and here you can see that I get also get total internal reflection. So not all um, incident wave angles give rise to a flow of energy away from the interface. Okay, it then also turns out because of the particular structure of this thing that I called Q, that I can set Q to be equal to cos theta. And if you remember what Q was, it was embedded in the definition of R and T. That means that R can be equal to zero and I get total transmission for certain parameters. Okay, and here's just one set of parameters. If I take H plus to be three, so that's a sunken pit, which is three times the outside depth, and H minus to be one third, so they go up through a third of the depth on the plus side of things, and I take this to be thin barriers, and I take the angle of the rotation to be 30 degrees, then I get perfect transmission for all wave numbers and for all wave incident wave angles. And I've represented this here by sending in Gaussian beams, so these are weighted integrals over all different wave angles centered around minus 50, zero degrees and plus 50 degrees. And you can see, okay, again, you can see that the phase velocity, for example, here is to the right, but the group velocity, the energy is traveling in a different direction. I mean, this is evident in all of these diagrams here. This one on the left shows you that the energy is coming in this way coming across here and down here, but the phase velocity is traveling backwards towards the interface. Okay, I should also say this is not, I've got two interfaces here. I'm going from a conventional depth to a metamaterial bathymetric plate array back to a conventional depth again. So I've done a slightly different problem here just to illustrate this negative refraction. Okay, so this is so this is all angle, all frequency transmission, albeit under a shallow water um, approximation. Okay, so that was a simple example where I had constant, I used constant depths, H plus and H minus. I can do more exotic things. 
So I can use essentially a, a transformation media method to bend waves perfectly through or almost perfectly through channels. So I can take a long straight channel. Okay, so this is what I've got on the left hand diagram here, where waves can just travel in uninterrupted from left to right. And I can think about taking a section of this trap, a channel, okay, and subjecting it to a coordinate transformation in which this channel gets bent. And then I can see what that coordinate transformation does to my underlying equation. So this is just transformation media methods. This is the mapping that I need to use. Uh, this is the consequence of that mapping, which is that I introduce um, a tensor for the depth and the requirement of that the, the, two, the two elements of this tensor is that they look like this. So in the RR direction, in the radial direction, I need um, the depth of the plates to disappear like one over R squared. And in the theta theta direction, I need the plates to go like R squared. So I have some sense in which um, the height of the plates and the height of the bed, the, okay, have to be prescribed in this particular way. Okay. and Following that, it turns so you have to worry about impedance matching at the boundary conditions because you've applied a mapping and the mapping has to be applied to the boundary conditions as well. It turns out that you can't get perfect impedance matching at the boundary, but you can do you can match the average, you can match the average of the impedance across the boundary. And when you do that, you get almost perfect transmission. Okay, so this represents a wave coming in from the left and being bent through um, this channel here without any reflection or without any loss of form. Okay, and perhaps in the last five minutes, um, I can just talk about um, some other stuff that I've been doing. I know this might be interesting to people at Imperial that have been looking at things like this as well. So Henry, for example. So this is about um, plate arrays. So using plate arrays as a water wave device. Um, in this particular form. So I'm not now thinking necessarily here about things, not just yet, things that are um, just associated with the bed. This is really going back to my original problem that I was thinking about where things extend uniformly through the depth. So now I've got a flat bed again, and I've let the plate arrays extend uniformly through the fluid and come out through the top of the fluid to form this kind of cylinder made up of these plate arrays. Okay, and so this actually this is the first problem that I started thinking about because I thought this was quite interesting because it had this property that if I send the waves in from this direction, the waves just pass straight through the plate array and it becomes completely transparent. And that clearly doesn't happen when I say send waves in from theta naught equals north. Okay, so now I'm back to potential flow in 2D. So there's an acoustic analog here. I solve the wave equation outside the cylinder Inside the cylinder, I homogenize, and that basically says that it restricts the motion of waves to just the y direction. So essentially, I've got a reduced Laplacian here. The, the derivatives with respect to x um, are um, neglected because there can be no motion in the x direction to first order approximation. I um, apply effective uh, uh, matching conditions at the boundary which is just that the flux and the pressure should be continuous. Um, there's a solution method associated with it, which I've just summarized here, but let me just try and show you what the results look like. Um, so this is work that I did with Simming, um, and uh, these are the types of results that you see, and they're very sensitive now to the wavelength in which you sent the waves in. So that wasn't something that's troubled us before, but is going to trouble us now. So here I've got a wavelength Ka is a non-dimensional wavelength. A is the radius of the cylinder. K is the wave number of uh, less than pi over 2. The wave is coming in from 45 degrees over a constant bed. And you can see that it's, it excites sort of near resonance in this plate array between the cylinders. I increase Ka to 1.4, so getting closer to, to pi over 2. And this resonance becomes stronger. So this field now is four times the, out, the exterior incident wave field. When I go beyond um, a half pi, what happens is, is that I get very large resonances. And in fact, the numerical scheme generally, well, let's just say fails to converge. Okay, so there's, there's something that's 
people that have listened to me talk about this before is this is something that I don't really understand. Um, okay, so you get this kind of non-convergence, but it's associated with the fact that I've kind of hit these kind of organ pipe resonances at particular locations within this kind of spectrum of plate lengths that's contained within uh, the circular plate array. Okay, so um, I mean, there are various ways of getting over this. One is to introduce damping. Um, and again, I've talked about that. And again, I'm slightly skeptical about actually what you should be doing there, but um, that's another story for another day and has been another story on another day. Just to let you know that this, this homogenization does work, right? So there are various problems that I've looked at where I've actually looked at discrete descriptions. This again is another problem that you can look at using a discrete description if you're prepared to do enough hard work. So this is the homogenized solution um, on the left. This is similar to the one that I've just shown you for KA is 1.2, I think. And this on the right is a description whereby we've used, um, I think it's aqua that was used, but some kind of boundary element method stroke some computational fluid dynamics to actually look at a discrete system of, I think, 20 plates. Okay, so this is the discrete system and this is the homogenized system. This is a lot of work and this is relatively straightforward, but it seems to work. Uh, these plate arrays, um, so you think, well, okay, that's sort of interesting because they're anisotropic, but do, do they do anything else? And there are two things that might be of interest. One is that um, they sort of store a lot of energy, so you can see the resonance effects or near resonant effects here, storing a lot of slow propagating wave energy moving through the cylinders. What it tends to do, these cylinders, it tends to accumulate this energy and then spit it out in a forward direction. So if you rotate, for example, two of these cylinders and get them to face inwards to one another, you can get very large focusing effects. And conversely, if you point them in opposite directions, you can defocus. Okay, so you can, this could be some kind of a quiet zone, some protected harbor zone here where you've um, moved the, the wave energy um, away from this protected zone. Okay, so it looks like you can use these as sort of like energy lenses for water waves. But of course, these have applications in acoustics as well. You can also think about using this with damping. So by including some damping in the system, and this has only just been done artificially at the moment, but you put a bit of artificial damping in the array itself, and you ask yourself, how much energy can you extract from these cylinders? And this is an idea of the type of energy that you can extract for different wave angles, and different amounts of damping. And just to put this in perspective, a traditional wave energy converter used in the ocean which, is, which works on rigid body heave motion, like a buoy moving up and down and taking energy out of the waves, that corresponds on this graph to one, okay? And um, whilst that isn't the most sophisticated way of taking energy out of, of the waves, the most sophisticated way of doing it probably at the moment is gives you three, okay? You can see that this gives you the potential to extract a lot more energy out of the ocean waves than currently exists through rigid, rigid body motion, mechanical devices which rely upon the three uh, translational modes and the three rotational modes of motion. Um, I will almost stop. This is going to be my last slide, which is, OK, um, shallow water theory. So I basically spent a lot of time talking about this shallow water theory and plate arrays, bathymetric plate arrays question is, is how good is shallow water theory? You know, I said it happens for all wave, all, for all wave numbers, you get this kind of all perfect, all frequency. Um, but of course, it's not all wavelengths and wave numbers, because it's restricted to long waves and shallow water. Okay, so um, the most recent work that I'm working on with Simming again is um, on looking at three dimensional, full three dimensional depth dependent modeling and comparing this with shallow water for truncated cylinders. So for those cylinders that I've just shown you that were extending previously through the depth, we've now essentially chopped the top off this so it only extends partly through the depth. Okay, and on the left-hand side of these two diagrams you've got here, we've got the full 3D, something that I've kind of avoided talking about apart from the Porter and Newman stuff. This is the full three-dimensional depth-dependent modeling 
and this is the equivalent bathymetric shallow water theory that I talked about before, okay, but now applied to circular cylinders. And these two look reasonably good in agreement, but, you know, there are some quite significant differences. And if you look at other metrics rather than just the surface elevation, you can see that there are quite significant differences apart from when the wavelength is much, much longer than the depth. And then these two things start to agree. Okay, and so um, um, that's basically all I want to say. Um, here's a quick summary. Um, perhaps the thing that I want to say in the summary here is, well, ah, <laughs> no. No. Yes, back again. What I wanted to say here was that water waves kind of offer a nice way of visualizing these effects that you see in acoustics and electromagnetics in experiments. So it's, it's nice. I always find it nice when people do experiments and show these things working with water waves. I know they're very difficult to do, but when you can actually see these things, it's always very, very nice. And the final thing is, is that I've talked about homogenization of the bulk, right, where you place things through the fluid to change the properties of the fluid or the wave bearing properties of the fluid. And I talked about things on the bottom where you've changed the bathymetry to influence the way in which the waves propagate. And uh, the thing I haven't talked about, but the thing that um, is where I'm going next is what, how you can manipulate waves by putting things on the surface. And I think the surface really is really, really interesting because the surface is in some sense active. You can put floating things there and you've got this interaction between floating masses, for example, and the float and the moving surface. And um, I'm, I'm hoping for some interesting results to come from that. But anyway, that's it. I'm I've now finished. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. This was a really fantastic talk. To you. So I hope that we will have lots of questions from the audience. So please, uh, people, come forward with your questions for Richard. I've got many personally, but please.